The Bible is God speaking to me. I am what the Word of God says I am. I can do what the Word of God says I can do. I have what the Word of God says I possess. I am a believer, not a doubter. My mind is renewed with the Word. Therefore, I'm thinking those thoughts that please my Father. I'm walking by faith and not by sight. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah and amen. Turn your Bibles, please, to the book of Hebrews. We're going to look at Hebrews chapter 11. And another place we're going to turn to is Mark chapter 11. So let's look at two places of Scripture. We're going to look at Hebrews chapter 11. One person said, how do you know God loves coffee? Because he brews. But I'm pumped. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 11. And we're going to look at this together. Hebrews chapter 11, beginning at verse 1. Hebrews 11, verse 1. The Bible gives us a definition of faith. Why is it so important for us as believers to major on the subject of faith? Well, because it's impossible to please God without faith. And faith is something all believers must learn how to walk in because the just shall live by faith. Well, the definition of faith according to Hebrews chapter 11, let's look at verse 1, says, Now... Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Again, Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Notice that faith is materiality or substance or tangibility of the things that are hoped for. Notice that faith gives substance, materiality, tangibility to the things that are hoped for. Hebrews 11 verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for the for it says for now faith is the substance of things hoped for what i want you to underline and highlight now is things hoped for things things and when i say things we're talking about entities we're talking about areas of something that you can identify a thing can be identified. A thing can be named. A thing can be described. A thing can be visibly seen in your heart, but it also can be eventually visibly seen in the natural three-dimensional physical world. But he says... Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. Are you aware that there are people who try to get things to manifest, but they have no hope for the thing? What is a hope for thing? Hope means a confident expectation of a better future. What is hope? A confident expectation of a better future. Now, question, is hope futuristic? Is it present tense or is hope past tense? Based upon the definition that I gave, hope is future tense. So since hope is future tense, it hasn't yet happened, 
Hope is something that you can see in a realm that's not tangible or physical. Hope exists in the realm where you can't lay your hands on it, but yet you can perhaps describe it. Perhaps you can yearn for it. You can desire to go after something that you really, really want, but yet it hadn't manifested yet. I like what one minister said, if you have a dream, a tech person with a dream and they are seeing themselves in the dream eating a, a ice cream cone on a hot day in the dream. And then the alarm clock goes off and they awaken and they're like, oh no, I was just getting ready to enjoy this ice cream cone that I was dreaming about. And they try to put the sleep mode on the alarm clock to get back to their place where they were dreaming. But no matter how much they try to get back to the dream, they can't pick it up from where they left off. And they're like, oh, I'm disappointed because I was having so much fun in the dream. Well, in the dream, it was something that they could experience, but yet it wasn't real. It wasn't manifested. It wasn't tangible in the natural realm. But yet they had an expectation in what they could envision and what they could see in the realm that's not visible to the naked eye. So faith is now, it says now faith is the substance, the materiality, the tangibility of things you hope for. So what is hope again? It's future tense. Hope is not manifested in the natural realm, but hope can be seen. Hope can be observed in the invisible realm. Am I making sense? Or we could say it this way. Hope can be a thing that you observe in like the dream place, the place of your imagination, but yet it's not yet manifested in the place where your five senses, your five physical senses can touch. Like the ice cream cone in the dream. So how do I get what I hope for to come to pass in the three-dimensional realm in which I live? Good thing you ask. Because the scripture says, now faith is the substance, the materiality, the tangibility of things you hope for. That means what I desired in the dream can come to pass in the natural. But I have to do something that allows for what I hoped for to come to pass. And what is that? I have to add faith to what I hope for. Because the scripture says in Hebrews 11, 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And it's possible then for things to be in a place that's not seen. I'll say that again. It's possible for things to exist in a realm that is not seen. Here again, Hebrews 11, 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And when you see the word not seen, I want you to write in the margin of your Bible, not perceived by the senses. Not perceived by the senses. That means you have five physical senses and those five physical senses may not bear witness to the very thing that you see in that realm that's invisible to the naked eye. But if you add faith to your hope, what you hope for can manifest in this three-dimensional realm through your faith. Now, what is then faith? Faith, we 
entitled it for this instruction, lessons of teaching last week and this week, faith is an action. Faith is an action. That's what you want to entitle this instruction. Faith is a what? An action. Now, since faith is an action, that means we're going to look at the place in Scripture where a person can have vision in the non-seen realm and then do something that makes what's in the non-seen realm come into the realm of the seen. Seeing is an expression of your sense, sight, Another aspect of your physical senses or five senses would be smell. Another one would be touch. Another one could be taste. Another one could be hearing. So your five senses may not have evidence of the very thing that you can see in the realm of the invisible or like the dream state. However, what is existing in the invisible realm to the natural senses can come to pass based upon your faith. Therefore, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, what do you mean by evidence of things not seen? If God says something, even if you don't see it in the natural it is still real and it does exist. It just exists in the realm of the non-perceivable areas of your five senses. For example, I've never seen hell, but I believe hell is real and I ain't going there. I don't have to go there to testify and say, you don't want to go to hell because it's hot down there. No, I'm not going to hell. I already know hell exists based upon what the scriptures say. Therefore, I'm good. I don't need to go to do the things that would require a person to go to hell. Now, how about heaven? Well, heaven exists. According to the scripture, we have understanding that Jesus talked about, I go to prepare a place for you. And where I'm going, I'm going to come back and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. I haven't seen, well, I have seen Jesus when he appeared to me the different times that he had, but it's not very often that he's appeared to me and I don't have to see him to know that he's alive from the dead and he's seated at the father's right hand. I just I know by faith Jesus is alive and well. And I know that he is seated at the father's right hand in heaven. Why? Because the Bible says so. Have you ever heard of the song? Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Because the Bible tells me so. You can be convinced of the existence of something simply on the basis of the information you received. Now, we do that all the time in court. In court cases, when they're trying to convict a person of a crime, the jury is listening to all the evidence that's being brought to the court case. The jury wasn't there when the perpetrator, the criminal, did the crime. They didn't have to. They don't have to be there to render a verdict. What do they do to render a verdict? They listen to the evidence presented. So the evidence puts the jury in a place where they can be totally convinced without a shadow of a doubt that the matter occurred even though they weren't there, but the evidence alone made it possible for them to render a conscientious decision or verdict saying the fate of this individual is going to be thus and such. How can the jury be so confident? Because of the facts, because of the information that let them know that they believe the perpetrator either did it or didn't do it. So God says, all of his people that receive Jesus, you haven't been to heaven, but one thing for sure, you can believe that Jesus is in heaven. 
You didn't go to hell, but you can believe that Jesus went to hell and suffered on your behalf and paid the price for you and rose from the dead because he did no sin and hell and death could not keep him because Jesus did not earn a place in hell. He was the Passover lamb and he suffered on our behalf with our sin he was able to become the Passover lamb. But he was able to come up from the dead, from death, hell, and the grave because he was right before God. He obeyed God, and by his obedience, he is now seated at the right hand of the Father where he ever lives to make intercession for us. Now, is a person going to say, well, since I've never seen Jesus, then I'll not believe him. Because I'll never believe anything I can't see. You ever heard anybody say that? I'll never believe anything I can't see. Well, you always believe things you can't see. Well, no, I'm so smart. I tell you what, I can't believe anything that I can't see. Well, you're really smart, aren't you? Yes. You have a brain, don't you? Yes. Have you ever seen your brain? No. How do you know you have one? But my point being is an individual can declare that they have confidence that something exists, even though they haven't seen it. And the reason that they are so convinced is because of the information that they have allows for them to say, I must have a brain because after all, I think. And since I think, it must be proof that I have a brain. So even though I've never seen my brain, but I'm a thinking individual, I must have a brain. Well, you can have that same process of thought when it comes to God's promises. God would not tell you to believe him for something that doesn't exist anywhere. It may exist, but it exists in the realm that your five senses cannot pick up just yet. But what's in the invisible realm can be manifested in the physical realm if you apply your faith to what God tells you exists, which your hope or confident expectation can be in what the promises of God are. Now let's look at Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. And we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 1 and see that God, our Heavenly Father, He's invisible, but yet He's real. And it would do good to have fear or reverence for God, even though you haven't seen God. But it would be a good idea for you to walk like he's real because he is real and take him at his word, even though your physical senses can't pick up on it. How do I contact God if I can't see him, if I can't with my five senses perceive him? What you can do is believe. You can believe and you can have hope in God and you can obey God and then your obedience to acting on what he says, then you can do what the Bible refers to. You can walk by faith, not by sight. Ephesians chapter one, verse one, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God to the saints, which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath, which is the old English word for has, who has blessed us with all, notice this, spiritual blessings. Who has blessed us with how many spiritual blessings? All spiritual blessings. That means all of the spiritual blessings that we have been blessed with must exist. Otherwise, he wouldn't tell you you've been blessed with all spiritual blessings that don't exist. He tells you with all spiritual blessings, and he'll tell you exactly where these spiritual blessings are. Where are they? In heavenly places in Christ. Wow. In Heavenly places in Christ. Well, heavenly, heavenly is not difficult to understand, especially when you take it at the level of 
what we've just gone through with the pandemic and all that kind of stuff, where people were afraid and wearing masks and altering their activities on a germ that they couldn't see. But the news media knew that unless they could paint a graphic picture of what the germ looked like, there's no way you're going to act like this germ exists. You got to have a picture of the or vision of a germ in order to act like the germ exists. So they kept showing you what a coronavirus germ looked like. This is what it looks like. This is what it looks like. Watch out for the coronavirus. And then they talk about it and talk about it and show you what it looks like in a graphic sense. Why? Because unless you are convinced of what you do not see, you're not going to change your actions. So they have to go on a media campaign to get you to see something that you can't see with your natural eye. This is pretty good teaching, isn't it? It's really good teaching. So now if the world can show you things that don't exist with the natural eye and you alter your behavior, some people still haven't come to church because they haven't what? They haven't seen the coronavirus die yet. Well, you didn't see it when it was alive. But why are your actions still showing and dictated by the media? It's because fear cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of the devil and faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And some people are like, you know what? I'm just safer at home as if the heavenly places where the coronavirus is supposed to be living or in the atmosphere of the air. The, the air you breathe in your place of residence is not the same air that we, we breathe here in church. Wow. Are you really convinced that the air you breathe at home was different than the air we breathe here in church? Yes. Why? Because you can see a coronavirus? No. You can't see the germ. So why are your actions the way they are? Your actions are always going to be based upon what you believe. What you believe the most is what you'll do. And that's the reason why God says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's why you want to keep allowing the word of God to keep coming into your heart by hearing it and hearing it and hearing it and hearing it. Because the more you hear God's word, the more it will impact your actions. And when you act on God's word, that's when you'll get God's results. So we're there in Ephesians chapter one. It says this in verse three of Ephesians chapter one. Blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us. That means it declares that it's already taken place. We've already been blessed. Us is referring to all Christians all over the world, all Christians who has blessed us. Who's blessed us? our God and our heavenly father in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who has, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Now, when it says heavenly places, he's referring to we have been blessed with blessings that exist in the realm that, of the unseen. Wow. Wow. We've been blessed. We've been declared heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus. We've been declared blessed with things we can't see with our physical eyes, with our natural ears, as it were. We can't perceive with our normal sense of operations. But yet we've been blessed with them. Wow. I'm blessed. That's right. You're blessed. So God speaks to you from a place that you can't see. You haven't seen heaven's throne. You haven't seen where God is, but yet you believe that he is. You believe God sits on the throne. You believe that Jesus is seated at his right hand. You believe that there are angels. You believe that there are people that have gone on to be with the Lord that have already passed away. So, and they're in the unseen place. So, Why is it hard for believers to be able to function like the unseen place of the natural eye? Why is it hard for believers to believe that what's up there can't manifest here? It can manifest here. 
In fact, aren't we supposed to be believing that thy will be done on earth as it is in where? Heaven? Apparently heaven must be a real place. Heaven must have some things going on in it that we who are on the earth, we just have to believe that what's going on in heaven is real good because we're supposed to believe that heaven's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And the Bible speaks of when you walk in the light of his word, you'll be as one who has heaven as one who has heaven on earth. There's no sickness and disease in heaven. Therefore, you don't want sickness and disease in your life on earth, right? That's the reason why we fight sickness and disease. We fight it because sickness and disease is an enemy to man. What? Yes. If man was made in the likeness and the image of God, if man was supposed to spend his life existing, fellowshipping with God, and since God does not have sickness and disease in heaven, why would you want sickness and disease to be on earth in your house? If health and healing and everybody in heaven is doing really good, that's with the Lord. Why wouldn't you want your life now to be really good where you are? The scriptures declare that in verse three of Ephesians one, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, somebody would say, well, how many people really understand heavenly places and those things exist there? Well, there was a man that came to Jesus, a very wealthy man, and he came to Jesus and said, good master, good master, what must I do to inherit or to have eternal life? So apparently this man, when he came to Jesus, he understood certain things. Number one, Jesus asked him, why do you call me good? There's nobody good but God. The man is like, I know who I'm talking to. I'm smart enough to know exactly who I'm talking to. You're Emmanuel, God with us in the flesh. So when I ask you, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That means eternal life whereby God is my continual habitation. My heart is at one with God and God can flow and function through me like he's flowing and functioning through you. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, apparently the rich man must have known this. He must have known that eternal life could be obtained. Why would he ask for something that couldn't be obtained? Now, Jesus told him this. He, first of all, he asked him the question, what must I do? But when the man said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Good master. Jesus said, why do you call me good? The man said, uh, I know who I'm talking to. Jesus said, there is only one person that's good, and that's God. Basically, the man is saying, I know. If I'm going to get an answer to my question, I'm coming to the right person. Jesus said, oh, what does the law say? And the man began to talk about the law. All these things I've done what the law says. I've done what the Ten Commandments have said. And therefore, I've observed these things from my youth. And the Bible says Jesus loved him. He wasn't mad at him. But the young man was missing it in this regard. He was missing it because he thought he fulfilled everything that the law said. And he wasn't an individual that fulfilled everything the law said because under the law, no man is justified. Under the law, the man was guilty of sin. Under the law, he had broken one of the commandments. Now, even if the man felt like I've really kept the commandments, but if he did keep all of the commandments, then wouldn't he be calling himself, I'm a good rich man and I got eternal life. And I just want to come talk to you, Jesus, because both of us know about this eternal life. Right. But no, the man asked, what can I do to obtain eternal life? I got plenty of stuff, but I don't have that eternal right standing with God, whereby heaven and I and God can say, we're one like you can say you're you and your father are one. 
Jesus said, one thing you lack. Man is thinking, what do you mean I lack? Why you got to use the term lack when I got all this wealth? Jesus said, <clears throat> um, go, sell things, give to the poor, come follow me. And you'll have treasure in heaven and we can get this work on. We can get this work on. In other words, you wanted to know how to have eternal life. I'm telling you, go sell what you have. Give to the poor. Come follow me because you're going to have treasure in heaven. Now, when the man heard Jesus say you'll have treasure in heaven, it really bothered him because he's like, hold on a minute. Now, I got tangible, physical things that I can put my hands on. Everybody know I'm rich. Jesus, you talk about I have treasure in heaven. Heaven is an unseen place. And I'm not trying to have treasure in heaven. I want to have what? Treasure here on the earth. And I want to be able to say, me and God got it going on. Well, God wants you to know that he wants you to have it going on. And there's nothing wrong with you having stuff on the earth. If it was a problem for him having things on the earth, the Bible would not have said that Jesus loved him. And and the man would not have been able to say all these things if I observed from my youth, meaning that it's by my honesty, by my integrity, it's by my respect, it's by my obedience to God's word that I happen to be this very wealthy man. Jesus wasn't mad at him being wealthy. If you obey the law of God, if you obey the word of God, prosperity will come on you and overtake you. It's just the way it is. A prosperous life is the outcome of an obedient life. But the problem was with the man was this. He loved things more than he loved God, which is a breaking of a commandment that you're supposed to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength and all that you are. You're to love God. You shouldn't have any other God before him. But this man's wealth was his God now. And since the man's wealth was his God, the man, when he heard what Jesus said, he turned around and walked away. And when he walked away, it was an astonishment to everybody who was observing because they're like, well, he came to Jesus to get something, but he walked away from Jesus without doing what Jesus told him to do. And Jesus was aware of the audience statements. And Jesus said, how hard is it for a rich man to get into heaven is as difficult as a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Now, some people don't know what the eye of a needle is. The eye of a needle was the description of the small gates that allowed for people to come into the city at nighttime because the big gates where you could caravan with things through were closed. And if you were coming into the the city at night, you come through the small gates. And you say, well, I'm a merchant man and I got caravans of camels that are going to come in and drop off some treasures and so forth so that I can have goods and services for people to trade within the city. But that small opening is called the eye of the needle. And in, if you're going to get into the gate at night, you got to unload all of the camels with their packages and you're going to have to bring each camel through without its load. And then while it's in there, you drag it through and then reload it on the other side. And so therefore, a person hearing, it's as difficult for a rich man to get into heaven as it is for the camel to go through the eye of the needle. People are thinking, well, wait a minute. That means it's impossible for somebody to get to heaven if they're rich? Question, how many of you have ever seen a needle? Do you know what a needle is? A needle is a thread, uh, something you put the thread through, correct? Did you know you can have a needle that's big enough with the eye of a needle that's big enough where you could drive a car through? If you make the needle big enough. So therefore, it wasn't about the rich man becoming poor. And if it was about him becoming poor, then he would have to He would have to reconsider what Jesus said. Jesus said, go and sell. He didn't say go and give away everything you have. He says, go and sell what you have. Give to the poor. But if God wants everybody poor, why would he tell the rich man to give to the poor? If he's if God is happy about people being poor, why would he tell the rich man to alleviate the conditions of the poor if being poor puts you on a better path with God? 
Because when the rich man started selling all of his wealth, wouldn't he take the pro proceeds from that and then give to the poor so that the poor would be changed in their impoverished condition? And then Jesus said, you'll have treasure in heaven. Come follow me. Let's get on up. This is work done. It doesn't make sense for Jesus to say sell and give if both of them was the same. Selling is not giving and giving is not selling. He told them to sell what you have, give to the poor, you'll have treasure in heaven, come and follow me. So apparently, this man understood the business language that Jesus used. God was not telling people, you need to be poor because God is impressed by your poverty. He is not. That's why he told the rich man, give to the poor. Why? God don't want anybody poor. Hmm. All right. But here's the thing that Jesus told the rich man, too. He says, you'll have treasure in heaven. And come and follow me We can get some work done. Now, why would Jesus tell this man you'll have treasure in heaven? Because the man was observant of the things that were being done by Jesus. He saw Jesus speak to poor and people were changed and blessed. He saw lives being changed, being healed and made whole. He saw blind eyes opening up. He saw people that were demonically influenced and couldn't do anything positive because they were so demonically influenced that when Jesus cast the spirit out by his word, people were made healthy and whole and now sane and able to be dressed and do it functioning wonderful things and they were normal citizens in society that could work and contribute to the lives being better well, well Jesus the rich man is thinking I've seen how you get down Jesus I, I want to have eternal life in my life too but the man had a problem he didn't recognize that his sin, which was the loving of things above God, was getting in the way. He had an opportunity to say, you know what? I'm going to cut these things, my love for the things, I'm going to cut that off. And I'm just going to go ahead and follow Jesus. And Jesus made mention to everybody that was watching him, especially his disciples, because the disciples said, Jesus, <laughs> we've left everything and we followed you. Now, if the disciples who followed the Lord had nothing, why would they say we've left everything and followed you? All they would have said was, well, we picked up and living off the street. And we came and followed you, Jesus, because we had nothing else better to do. No, these people were business people. Tax collectors, fishermen. If you ever studied the fishing industry, you'll find that to be a very lucrative business. Fishing industry is very lucrative. If you if you own your own boats, you know where to fish. You know how to get down with the supplies and the tools that you have. Fishing can be extremely lucrative. These are businessmen. And these businessmen said, we left everything, Jesus, and we followed you. Peter finally said, hey, look, now I'm an industry fisherman, third generation fisherman. My father was a fisherman, grandfather a fisherman. We got boats and nets and I left all of that and I'm following you, Jesus. You said it's harder for a rich man to get into heaven just as it is for a rich, for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Peter said, then who can be saved? In other words, <laughs> what's rich? Because what's a, a, a wealthy for one person may be poverty for another. A person said, well, I spent $100 for this dress. But when you talk to some people who have stylists that dress them and they spend $10,000 on a dress and you tell them I spent $100, they're like, $100? My purse costs $100. In other words, they would be willing to tell them that's not an expensive dress. A $10,000 dress may be considered expensive. My point being is, it's subject to the eye of the one Who's dealing with it? So when the disciples said, we've left all and follow thee, Jesus said, I know that you're having challenge. He, he's thinking this. He's thinking this. I know you all are having a challenge with this. So therefore, let me tell you, no man can leave houses, fathers, mothers, children, wives, brothers and sisters for the gospel's sake and not have a blessed life in heaven and on earth. 
They were like, whew, so glad you said that. <laughs> I can receive a hundredfold in this life and in the one to come. That's right. So in other words, your investment in following Jesus is not going to guarantee you being poor. Contrary to what the devil says. Your investment in serving Jesus will actually result in you being more prosperous. But when you're prospering on this side of the transaction of committing your life to Christ, it's a blessed life with no sorrow. The blessing of the Lord, it maketh thee rich, and with it he adds no sorrow. Now, the rich man that Jesus spoke to that walked away from Jesus, he didn't focus on the fact that Jesus said, you'll have treasure in heaven. Because the man is thinking, well, I got treasures down here. But Jesus said, you have treasure in heaven. That's really, really important thing because we're reading in Ephesians chapter one. Ephesians chapter one, the Bible says he has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in where? In heavenly places. Turn back over there. Keep Ephesians chapter one in verse three. Blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Which means we have been blessed in heavenly places, but it's not physical it's not in the sense that our eyes and our, our five senses can touch it. That bothers some people. But when you understand what Jesus was offering the man, when you're in a position where you're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, do you think that there is a bankruptcy court in heaven? Do you think that there's any, any inch of lack or poverty in heaven? No way, no how. So when he talks about spiritual blessings in heavenly places, he's talking about a vast supply that will meet every issue or condition you could ever meet or deal with. If you need a boat to cross the water and there's no boat, then you'll walk on the water by God's ability from heaven. If you needed money to pay the taxes and you don't have the money on you right away, Jesus told Peter, Peter, go fishing. Throw your hook in the water. The first fish that comes up, open its mouth. There'll be gold in its mouth. You'll pay the taxes for me and thee. Peter did. And Peter paid attention. You know what? There's no shortage with God. No shortage. There's no shortage with God. If you're obeying God and you're doing his will, you'll always, you'll always be aware. He'll supply your need. He'll supply your need. One time Jesus was getting ready to go into Jerusalem where he needed to ride in on a donkey. And he told his disciples, he said, go in town and the first donkey you see, untie it, bring it here. If somebody stops you, tell him that the Lord has need of it. They're like, wait a minute, Jesus. And I'm going to use this in the colloquial. That means common everyday vernacular. Jesus, they shoot horse thieves. They hang horse thieves. You want us to go and untie a donkey and bring it to you so you can ride into town? Jesus, if we do that, after we untie it and start bringing it and they stop us, we're guilty of thievery already. We can get hung for that. But the response he told them to say was, Tell them that the Lord has need of it. They brought the donkey to Jesus. Jesus rode into town, into Jerusalem. And of course, we know the rest of it. He was examined and crucified. But he had to be brought into town on the donkey, just like the scripture said. What I'm getting to you is this. When you obey God and choose to walk by faith and not by sight, you're not throwing yourself off into a foolish zone. You're actually positioning yourself to act like what you are, which is an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ. And all that God says he's provided for you is available at your disposal. And that's why Jesus told the rich man, he said, you'll have treasure in heaven. Come on and follow me. Why? Because Places that Jesus was going to go, he needed to have somebody who had faith. Faith is acting on what you believe. 
What was more important than stuff? Faith. Faith. And when you really think about it and analyze it, the Bible is not a storybook to tell you fairy tales. The Bible tells you factually what took place. Question I want to ask all of you brilliant students of the scriptures. You know, during Christmas time, you hear the story of the wise men that came to Jesus. They were called magi. Another name for saying that is that not only were they wise, but they were people of wealthy means because they were kings from the east. Now, how many kings, do you, kings now, kings, how many kings do you know bring a little dust bag of gold to drop off? Kings caravanning to go see the Emmanuel. They're going to bring just a little dust bag of gold. People said frankincense, gold and myrrh. So they're going to travel all that way. Just to drop off a little rhubarb sticks, a little incense, and a little gold. Kings leaving their kingdoms to come drop off gifts to the one who is going to change the world. They were bringing straight up wealth. And there's scripture for that in Isaiah, the 60th chapter. My question to you is this. All the wealth that they brought to Jesus when he was a baby or a child What happened to all that gold? What happened to all that frankincense and myrrh? What did Mary and Joseph do with that wealth? Now, if they were scripturally Jewish people to walk in line with Jewish scripture, the Bible says a good man leaveth wealth and inheritance for his children's children. It would have been unscriptural and un-Jewish for them to spend up all the gold and wealth that those kings brought. That would have been a contrary thing to scripture. So what happened to their wealth? I'm sure they put it up for him. So those 12 disciples that followed Jesus that were businessmen, do you think that they were well cared for and paid for for the three and a half years that they walked with him in his ministry? Jesus was their boss. They had families and industries that they left. Who took care of them? Jesus did. Didn't Jesus have a treasurer named Judas Iscariot? Wasn't he dipping in the bag and stealing from it? If Jesus only had just a couple of dollars in the bank, how can a thief steal a couple of dollars and it not be discovered right away? What I'm telling you, sometimes Hollywood or the pictures can depict Uh, A a poor, broke down Jesus, but not a scriptural description of a Jewish man obeying God, being blessed by God and walking in the power of God. Your understanding of Jesus should be scriptural, not what people try to paint him to look like outside of the scriptures. Jesus knew about wealth. Kings dropped off wealth for him when he was a child. He had an employment program where he had a treasurer. People with no money don't need a treasurer. And if you turn water into wine, if you can multiply fishes into bread like Jesus did, I guarantee you won't take too long for you to be wealthy either. If you're healing people and raising people from the dead, just out of gratitude, people go hook you up. You're changing their life. They're going to hook you up. You think Jesus wasn't shown appreciation by those that were blessed by his ministry. In fact, the Bible says that there were women that followed him in his ministry that ministered unto him from their treasuries. Now, I'm not preaching to you. You just talk about money, money. No, I'm talking about when God says, I've blessed you with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. He's letting you know. Spiritual things are more important than physical things. And by your obedience to the word of God, you un, you make it possible for the spiritual things to be released on your behalf and things will just start working for you. Abundance will be yours. Do you go after money? No, you go after God. But in going after God, you do it by obedience to his word. And how do you get from God? You get from God by acting 
on what he says. Jesus went to the wedding of Cana of Galilee, the first miracle that he did. There were a couple that was getting married and they ran out of wine and they were like, Mary said, Jesus' mother said, hey, they don't have any wine, which means freshly squeezed grape juice. It wasn't this stuff that you're selling now, all potent to stuff where you get arrested and that kind of thing for being inebriated. But freshly squeezed grape juice is the way it reads in the Greek. The disciples were paying attention to what was going on and Mary was told by Jesus when she said, Jesus, they have no wine. He said, well, what do I have to do with you? In other words, why are you asking me? I ain't throwing this wedding. They throwing a wedding. But she knew if I ask Jesus, my son, who is walking with God, fulfilling what God told him to do, he don't have any lack. What am I, woman, what do I have to do with you? She was like, I ain't saying nothing to respond to that. She went to the disciples. Mary went to Jesus' disciples and said, whatever he tells you to do, just do it. Jesus said, oh, boy, I see now. Now, I'm thinking. This is how he's thinking. I see now mom wants me to meet the need. She wants God to move. They came to me for the, to meet the need. So I'm going to go ahead and move on that. He told his disciples, go and fill up the water pots filled with water and then serve the people. Now, a normal thinking person would say, Jesus, why would you have me to fill up this large water pot with water and go serve the people when they ask you for some freshly squeezed grape juice? I mean, that's kind of ridiculous for me to pour water. People ain't silly. But see, when you do what God tells you to do, even if it sounds silly, it's going to work out because faith is acting on the word of God. Faith is an action. Faith is an action. Faith is an action. Faith is an action. They did what Jesus said to do. And when they start pouring it out, the water that they poured out of the container turned into freshly squeezed grape juice. The governor of the feast said, now I've been to a whole lot of weddings. Most people, they take the best stuff and they put it out first and then they bring the rancid, stale stuff out later. But y'all, you, you saved the best for last. Which meant, it was real freshly squeezed grape juice. If you could do that, how much money would you be blessed with? I mean, the news media would be all over you. Do it again. Do it again. <laughs> My point being is this. You've been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. There's no shortage in heaven. There's no shortages with God. God, he says, I've already blessed you with it. Now, how do I get what's in heaven to come down to three dimensional planet Earth where I can touch it and perceive it with my five senses? I do that with my faith and faith is acting on the word of God. Did you learn something today? Good. I'm glad you did. Salvation is the free gift that the Lord offers anyone who would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, that with our hearts we believe unto righteousness and with our mouth confession is made unto salvation. I trust that you will believe God's word, that your faith will be in the risen Savior who came to give his life for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish and have everlasting life. Will you pray with me this prayer of salvation? It's not difficult. It's very easy, but you must mean it from your heart. So repeat these words after me. Jesus, I confess you as my Savior and my Lord. I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead. With my mouth, I confess you and I receive you as my Savior. Jesus, thank you for making my heart your home. Thank you for living in me. God the Father is now my Father, and the Holy Spirit has done a work in me. I am a new creature in Christ Jesus, my Lord. Thank you, Lord, for saving me, and thank you for guiding my life. In Jesus' name, amen. We're here to be a blessing to you at Spiritful Christian Center. The way this broadcast is brought to you is by people's faithful sowing and reaping as a result of God's word being given unto them. So I want to encourage you, be a part of this ministry of sowing and reaping. 
The Bible says, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. In this ministry, we believe that man must hear the word of God. For man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The Bible declares, God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always have all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. God loves a cheerful and hilarious giver. I encourage you, be a part of this ministry. Be hilarious in your giving and watch the Lord bring it back to you in many, many ways. In Jesus' name. You have been watching the Spirit Food Christian Center worldwide webcast online at www.myspiritfood.com. Join us for worship service each Sunday at 9.30 a.m. And be sure to check out our website for our weekly live broadcast and much, much more. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good.